place. Rita, I want to explore this a bit more with you because one of the things that we were told by Red Bridge pollsters early on in the campaign was that this was going to be the great issue where, <laughs> you know, the oldies were going to be shuffled off and this new progressive, woke, young tide of voters was going kind to of come in and shift the country irrevocably to the left. Now, that has not happened. Rita, is the, you know, we see also that in Queensland now, liberals are polling 55 to 45, again, off the back of a lot of young voters, because you don't get those numbers without them. Is this whole lefty wish-casting idea that somehow <laughs> the young folks are going to come through and save us and make this a glorious socialist paradise that's all nonsense, isn't it? We've heard this all before. This is what the left always do, and all the leftist pundits that, sadly, a lot of people in the Liberal Party listen to, mm. and they veer left thinking that's the way to win elections. It's not, not in this country anyhow. Um, younger people become older eventually. They buy homes, they have families, their politics change. So their under-35 sensibilities don't last throughout their life. And we saw this back in 2007, 2008. You'll remember then, Labor were in government federally. We had the massive landslide to K-Ride and they held every single state and territory. And this talk was very prevalent mm -hmm. then that the country's changed, conservatives have got to forget about being conservative if they ever want to get elected again. Guess what? Uh, we had the 10-year anniversary <laughs> just a couple of days ago. There was a landslide victory for the Liberals, uh, you know, a few years later. So this doesn't... The, the, the left always think when they win an election that that's the final election. Things have always changed right. forever. Well, they always right. wish it was the, the final, final election. election. They always <laughs> wish it was the final election. They say, and now we're in power, we don't need to hold elections I, anymore. But I, I think the great thing with this debate, because this is so important, this is more important than any election, this referendum, because we're talking about our constitution... Mm -hmm. Correct. ..our founding document. But when we started this debate... The yes vote was around 70%. 70%. People mm. thought it, it, it could not be defeated. And you show, when you actually give people a choice, when you actually present them with both sides of the argument, when you articulate a case strongly, then people, more often than not, in this country will veer to the Conservative well, side. But we just don't have the strong politicians often who will do that because they're always trying to appease the people who will never vote for them. Well, that's right. But I think also, Rita and James, I think one of the things that has really, really pushed so many into the no camp is also the behaviour of the yes camp and this idea that if you do not vote for the voice, if you have questions about the voice, you are spreading misinformation, you are evil, you are a racist, you are not a good person, you don't like Aboriginal people. None of these things are true of no voters. And yet, case this week where students at Charles Darwin University were told that they should reconsider mm. a career in allied health if they do not support the Indigenous voice to Parliament. James McPherson, this sort of bullying mm. is exactly the reason why so many people look at the voice to Parliament. They look at creating another chapter to the Constitution. They look at the way the High Court will wind up ultimately being the arbiter of this, and they say, if this is how you're going to behave and demonize yeah. half the population, more than half now, I don't want anything to do with it. This is an incredible story. I mean, you've got speech pathology students being emailed by their professor and told, if you are going to vote no, maybe you should reconsider your career. I suggest this professor should reconsider her career in teaching. It makes you wonder what other political views students ought to hold if they hope to pass this class. But the other thing this reveals is the stupidity of corporates declaring a position mm -hmm. on an issue that individuals vote on. The, the Speech Pathology Australia organisation, they declared, we are in support of The Voice. So is it any surprise that a professor lecturing speech pathology says, well, if you're going to be part of the association, you ought also vote yes. So this demonstrates the foolishness of corporations, of organisations declaring a position that individuals are voting on. No organisations are voting. What? It's a silly well, position to hold. This but is where Australia all of us, uh, and I know a lot of people are very hesitant to discuss these issues or even post it on their own Facebook page because, you know, their green-haired niece is going to sort of have a tantrum <laughs> about it. But you need to find your backbone and you need to state your objection. If you've got an organisation, if your organisation, if a professional body is stating a position that you as a member do not agree with, 
politely pointed out. I, I just think yeah. the Conservatives have had to find their voice. This silent uh, and you know, majority you know, thing one of the ain't things, working. One of the things that's really interesting to me about this is the way social media has been used mm. so effectively mm. by the people who are running the No campaign. Because I'll tell you what, I live in the inner west of Sydney. This is... Yes, country. This is Grainler. Uh, Albanese kicked off the campaign a few months ago at a park down the road from me. Every third sign is yes. Do you think anyone would dare put a no sign on their gate? Of course not. And yet, no is winning because it's not even about that sort of thing anymore. It's this sly insurgency online, which has done such a good job. And people, though, are really concerned about where this all goes because when the government says, oh, it's just about 439 words of this tiny little first cover page of the Uluru Statement, people think otherwise.